ice cream. Cool, refreshing, almost intoxicating. It's impossible to be unhappy with that little scoop of heaven in your bowl. But ice cream is more than a tasty treat. It's a complex matrix of crystals, bubbles, and fat globules trying to break apart. In fact, scientists all over the world have dedicated decades of research to making this dessert more stable. Madness. Banana and chocolate. Praline and chocolates. Everybody has a favorite flavor of ice cream, but what about a favorite mouthfeel or a favorite texture? When it comes to ice cream, getting the taste right, that's the easy part. But if you want that perfect structure of air bubbles, fat globules, ice crystals, and sugary liquid, well, that's tough. It's been keeping scientists busy for over a century. This is Penn State University. In the dairy business, it's known as one of the best places to learn about ice cream. They've been studying the frozen treat here since the 19th century. Bob Roberts is the man in charge of the program now. He educates the biggest ice cream manufacturers in the world, and he's popular at parties as well. I studied yogurt for almost 15 years, and nobody asked me about yogurt except other scientists and maybe yogurt manufacturers. When I start to study ice cream, uh, all of a sudden I'm the world's best friend. It's easy to see why he gets the attention. Ice cream makes people happy. As for why ice cream making is so complex, well, that requires delving into some pretty sophisticated physical chemistry. Ice cream has been on the agenda since 1914 at the University of Guelph in southwestern Ontario. Doug Goff has run the program for 14 years. From a physical chemistry point of view, there's three or four major phases that all interact with each other and that all have to be right. Phases are structural elements. While a house is made of brick, steel, wood and glass, ice cream is composed of air bubbles, fat globules, ice crystals, and unfrozen liquid. Each makes a specific and significant contribution to our enjoyment. Perhaps the most surprising element is air. Some ice cream can actually contain more air, or overrun in trade lingo, than sugar and cream. If it didn't have air, it would be frozen hard like, a, like an ice cube. You want to make it, those bubbles so small that you really can't detect them. That's a problem. Tiny bubbles inside the liquid form foam. And if you spend any time staring at the head on beer, you'll notice that foams fall apart. Tiny bubbles merge into big bubbles. Nature prefers to minimize contact between dissimilar substances, such as water and air and big bubbles have less surface area than a lot of little bubbles. The big bubbles in foam eventually collapse in the liquid. You solve that problem by introducing a new roommate into the house, fat. Whipping a bowl of cream, heavy cream, makes a great demonstration for the fat structuring process in ice cream. The process of, of the agitation, the, the whipping that's going on, and the air incorporation that's happening to the cream is causing all of these little tiny fat globules to come together and to start to form chains and clusters and so on, basically a three-dimensional network of fat that then exists throughout the product and holds the air in place and especially holds the water in place. The water content is exactly the same as the cream that you start with in the whipped cream at the end. The difference is that it's trapped and held by this fat structure. Essentially, the tiny fat globules are smashed together. 
crystals within the globule will puncture the neighbor globule and stick to its crystals. Bunches of these globules trap air within their tentacles. But fat molecules don't want to have anything to do with water. Forget about it. To get them to bind, you need an emulsifier. If you mix oil and water together, for example, in a salad dressing and shake it up, the oil separates very quickly because it doesn't like to be in contact with the water or it's hydrophobic. When we add an emulsifier, an emulsifier is a compound which has a hydrophobic, that is an end that doesn't like water, and a hydrophilic, that is an end that does like water, all in the same molecule, so it's a bifunctional molecule. So one end sticks to the fat, the other to the water. Now air, fat, and liquid live together in harmony. But like many roommate situations, this ceasefire can't last. Take another look at the whipped cream. After a while, it falls apart. Small bubbles join together to form big bubbles, the crystals in the fat melt in the warmth, and the structure falls apart under its weight. So how do you keep the whole thing together? Add another roommate, ice crystals. Ice crystals give the product rigidity, just like the girders in a building. But not all the liquid crystallizes. The addition of sugar to water dramatically lowers its freezing point. That's a good thing, because the sugary sweet solution also contributes to the fantastic feeling ice cream creates on your tongue. And there you have it, perfectly stabilized ice cream. Now that this perfect structure is established, it deteriorates at every chance it gets. Every time you pull ice cream out of the freezer, for example, or ship it uh, in a truck from the manufacturing plant to the supermarkets and from the supermarkets home and so on, when the ice cream warms up, the smallest ice crystals melt. That can be a problem. These are ice crystals in ice cream as seen through a microscope. As the mix heats up, crystals melt. As it cools again, the liquid refreezes and the crystals grow. When a crystal melts completely, it won't reform. Its liquid will just latch on to existing crystals. As the pattern repeats, you get fewer but larger crystals. So because of this heat shock, the ice cream gets coarse. To combat this, stabilizers are added. They form a scaffold around the tiny crystals. When the crystals melt, the stabilizer absorbs their moisture. When the product is cooled again, the moisture reattaches to the nucleus. Stabilizers can be made from seaweed, locust bean gum, or guar gum. They won't prevent the damage caused by heat shock, but they can slow it down. Manufacturers go to great lengths to protect the delicate structure of ice cream. They are also scrupulous in protecting the health of the ice cream lovers everywhere. In England, legend holds that Charles I decreed that ice cream should only be served at royal functions, and if the chef dared to give away the recipe, off with his head. But Charles I was beheaded in 1648, and the chef was free to shop his wares. In the New World, George Washington supposedly spent hundreds of dollars on the delicious dessert one summer. When New Jersey's Nancy Johnson introduced a hand-cranked freezer in 1845, anyone could create this heavenly treat. If you're in Toronto's beach area, stop in on a former physics student and computer network builder. These days, he's still involved in science. The delicious chemistry of making ice cream. His name is Ed Francis. Here I know a lot of people. I know a lot of the little kids. I like a lot of the little kids know who I am. And I think I wanted that sort of environment. 
Now, if you have a hankering for ice cream and you're not in the south of Toronto, you could drop by a Baskin Robbins. They both make a delicious product, but there is a difference in the scope of their production. During a summer jazz festival, Ed cranked out 20 11-liter tubs a day, all by his lonesome. At the Baskin Robbins factory in Peterborough, just up the road from Toronto, they can make 7,500 tubs a day. After all, they are feeding the bulk of Canada and 30 other countries to boot. The process of making ice cream starts right here with this special antibacterial soap. Because what doesn't go into ice cream is as important as what does. So we gotta get cleaned up. No rings, no watches. Special disinfectant soap. Hairnet, of course, followed by an iodine wash. And only when we're really clean can we even think about making ice cream. And the handling starts right here. Cream, milk solids, sugars, emulsifiers, stabilizers, and some flavors join the party. For most types of ice cream, a common base is made, containing some vanilla flavor, plus the usual suspects. At this point, you have vanilla ice cream mix. For chocolate ice cream, add some chocolate flavor, and that's it. Then the mix goes into a homogenizing machine. Fat globules are smashed into pieces that mix into the solution. If you didn't do this, the fat would float to the top. Now it's time to kill bacteria, and that means pasteurizing. The mix is pumped through small tubes in this machine. It heats up to 80 degrees Celsius and is held for 30 seconds. Ed's process is simpler. He heats the mix on the stove. His ingredients are often more common as well. Big producers may use a fancy emulsifier like polyoxymethylene sorbitan monoleate. Ed uses some eggs. Now it's time to let the mix sit, usually between 4 and 24 hours. Baskin Robbins uses large cooling tanks. During that aging process, the ice cream mix goes through a number of changes. Uh, the first of which is that protein and other ingredients that have been added will hydrate and pick up water. Um, another thing that occurs during that time period is that the fat will crystallize. Both changes add texture and flavor. Speaking of flavor, it's added just before the mix is frozen. For Baskin Robbins, this happens in a mix tank. Ed drops the flavors into the pot. Then comes a crucial step, freezing. Ed sometimes uses the traditional engine crank barrel freezer. A bucket full of mix is put into a barrel. Paddles are put into the bucket and attached to the motor. The paddles scrape freezing mix off the sides of the bucket. But there is a problem with this method. It takes 40 minutes to freeze the ice cream. This creates relatively large ice crystals. So Ed uses this baby. It's better at scraping off the freezer mix and it freezes the ice cream in about 12 minutes. It's also smarter than the barrel. This one has an electronic brain in it, so once it freezes it to the desired consistency, it'll turn the compressor on and off automatically so that you can go away for a minute, come back, and the ice cream's still the right consistency, whereas the ice and salt one just keeps making it harder and harder and harder. At Baskin Robbins, the mix is pushed through one of three barrel freezers. Compressed air is pumped in to give the ice cream its overrun. This adds fluffiness to the product. The pipes are surrounded by freezing ammonia. As it passes through, it freezes onto the outside wall of the chamber. Uh, there's a dasher inside with blades on it that uh, spin around and scrape uh, that frozen mix off of the outside and mix it in with the 
balance of the mix in there, which creates the freezing. The freezer we have is capable of producing 1,200 gallons of finished product per hour. Because the tube is narrow, a great deal of the mix comes in contact with the cold surface of the tube. That means a quick freeze and small ice crystals. Next step, the fruit feeder adds ingredients like cookie dough or chocolate chips. Baskin Robbins is always looking for new and interesting flavors. They celebrated the moon landing with lunar cheesecake. Now it's time to package. A cube pumps the product right into the tub. Twist the barrel during the fill and you get a nice swirl. Ed empties the freezer and adds the ingredients. Then it's time for hardening. Baskin Robbins has a huge blast freezer where the minus 40 degree temperature is made even colder by huge fans that circulate the air. This process allows the tiny ice crystals to grow and gives the ice cream that rigid matrix. Hardening takes about a day. But before you can enjoy the taste, ice cream has to pass the test. Who invented ice cream? Some claim it was the Chinese who created a milk and rice dessert more than 4,000 years ago. Marco Polo brought icy desserts filled with fruit and milk back from the Orient in the 13th century. A nod goes to Catherine de' Medici, who charmed the French court with an early version of ice cream. Italian chefs served a different flavor on each of the 34 days of the celebration of her wedding. Believe it or not, these people are actually working. Before Baskin Robbins ships any of their 31 flavors, they have to be evaluated. Employees are actually encouraged to taste the product along the line to make sure it's fresh. Freshly made tubs are also evaluated a couple of times a week. Testers look for air pockets, distribution of fruit or chocolate chips, the proper pattern of a swirl, and of course, taste. Taste evaluation, Laura? Um, I thought all the flavors were good. Mm -hmm. Did you get a nice clean break between the white and the, and the yellow? The, you, you got the orange, sorry, you got the nice orange delivery as well as... Yes, I did, it, but I, in the muddy sections, it was a little unclear because of the strength of the cheesecake base. Could you just make a note that the, the um, orange tends to blend with the white? giving a muddy appearance so that we know how to evaluate this in the future. One of the most important tests that is carried out on the finished product is microbial testing on these little plates. They test for coliform bacteria, all kinds of other bacteria to make sure that there's nothing in the finished product. And indeed, there is nothing, which shows that all of that decontamination really works. So now we know it is really time to dig in and give it a taste. And that usually brings out the crowd I'm going to go for this uh, Rhapsody in Blueberry. Mm, great stabilization, emulsification, not the least bit gritty. Smooth, great. I always did love Gershwin. All that hard work and days of production pay off in that moment when the treat hits the tongue. There are all kinds of ways to make delicious ice cream, but what if you don't have much time? Well, you can make it pretty quickly. First, you need some liquid nitrogen. You'll also need the ice cream mix. This is cream, milk, sugar, and vanilla flavor. Pour it into a styrofoam cup. Now add the liquid nitrogen, minus 195 degrees Celsius, it's going to freeze it very, very quickly. As the liquid nitrogen evaporates, it aerates the ice cream, giving it a fluffy consistency. The constant stirring creates very small ice crystals. So what do we have? Some delicious instant ice cream. 
That delicious explosion of chemicals is the reason people go to such great lengths to create this icy treasure. The cone was added to ice cream at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair when an ice cream maker ran out of bowls and substituted a waffle. People will go to great lengths for that satisfying mouthful of chili goodness. But be careful. If you eat it too fast, you'll get ice cream headache. The cold can cause blood vessels to constrict and squeeze a nerve, sending a shock of pain to your head. And if you eat too much ice cream, you'll take in an awful lot of fat and sugar. So how do we enjoy the benefits of ice cream without suffering the consequences? Especially since eating ice cream can be addictive. A study at the U.S. Institute of Drug Abuse suggested that eating it stimulates the same receptors in the brain as certain drugs. To curb your craving, try one of the new flavors commercial manufacturers are tinkering with. Garlic, spinach, pumpkin or tuna. As for health issues, how about replacing some of the ingredients? Substitute potato starch for sugar and milk fats. It's sweet and won't raise your cholesterol. Well, come on now, we're talking about messing with perfection here. Ice cream is all about flavor, and you don't want to interfere with that. Treat it like a treat, and allowing that delicate matrix of your favorite flavor to collapse on your taste buds from time to time should be no problem. Now, that's what I call the right chemistry.